to do is understand herself. So when she moves out to the country, what happens is she starts painting, but only from colors, shapes. She doesn't think and try to do something that will please anybody. She's on her own, so she can do whatever she wants. And what happens is that she taps into old memories, painful memories, sometimes nice memories, and it's a journey for her in her life to become who she really is. So that's really what happens. It's a novel, okay? So Sophie, my daughter, will do because she's much better at it than I am. <laughs> she's just shy. <laughs> Julia takes pleasure in looking across the street at the well-tended houses, the postman chatting with every single person he meets on his run, the children walking to school, even the gloomy teenager hidden under a hood and dragging his body to some place he doesn't want to be. Life has a different color this morning, as if she was wearing polarized lenses. Contrasts are deeper, colors are bolder, attentive to subtle nuances and details. She feels more acutely aware of everything. Slowly, she eats her croissant, alternates with salt, small sips of piping hot coffee. And through the art shop's window, she sees Stone, the owner, busily going about his day. Oddly, it makes her feel secure. As soon as she is finished with breakfast, Julia crosses the street to the art shop. She chooses her canvases and asks for them to be delivered later this evening. One more stop, the grocery store. Now this poses a bit of a problem. She's not difficult and doesn't eat a lot of meat, so that is a blessing, because on a small budget, it would be difficult to manage. Spending precious time cooking is quite out of the question, as she has more important things to do nowadays. So she picks up, she picks up all sorts of canned soups, whole grain bread, frozen pizza, oatmeal and dried fruits. There, it should do for a week. And there's always the Half Moon Cafe for emergencies. The heavy bags plunked into the car's trunk. Julia drives slowly, prepared for a long journey. She puts away the groceries into the cupboards, already very much at home. Her decision to leave everything behind has been the right one. In the studio, she rearranges her easel for the light to hit the canvas just so. She aligns colors and paint brushes, painting fluids and brush cleaner. <coughs> She turns on Indian flute very softly. She doesn't want the music to insinuate itself into her thoughts, simply to map the road and block out other noises. She checks the time, 10.15. She would not be disturbed for at least seven hours. Stone will bring the remaining canvases when the store closes at six. Nobody else will interrupt. Bliss. Julia looks at her first painting. What if there's only one painting? What if that whole experience was just a freak accident? What if she can't ever touch again the deep, mysterious undercurrent? She pushes the creeping doubt from her mind. That was always the problem, her mind, and exactly what she wants to avoid. Before coming here, she had always worked with her mind, precise, well-executed drawings, hiding ugly feelings under cold perfection. Nobody could read the fear, sadness, guilt, frustration, and anger into the carefully polished pictures. She was a fraud. This is her chance to know if she has anything else inside or if that desert is all consuming and the damage is beyond repair. She shivers. Her mind floats as her eyes wander on the colors spread on the palette. Which one calls? Shia Lazarin Crimson, Formal Ultramarine, Extravagant vermilion? Or is it romantic cerulean blue, dramatic manganese violet, or bright viridian green? She takes up a paintbrush and dips it into blinding cadmium yellow. The bristles gently bend and the grain of the canvas disappears under the yellow paste. She falls into a field of blooming marigolds. Why marigolds? She hates marigolds. They smell bad. They're short, chubby flowers, stubbornly yellow, with not a trace of subtlety. 
the rounded little heads don't even know how to die with style. They just shrivel up and turn an ugly shade of brown. But there she is, spread out on the big smelly yellow cushion. She tries to get up, but when she crushes them, the flowers turn into yellow mush, thick and slippery. Frustrated, she fights against the sloth, and her anger grows as she can hear a derisive snicker from the thousands of flowers softly swaying in the breeze. Anger brings tears to her eyes. She can hear the laughter and the mockery. Oh, she cries, she cries, repeated over and over. Waves of pain and incomprehension wash through her. Indifferent to distress, the flowers continue to chant. Julia's anger reaches new levels. With great effort, she manages to extract herself from the crushed flowers. Standing up and defiant, she steps on the spiteful creatures. Yellow paint splashes everywhere as the chanting continues. With all her might, Julia wishes for a storm that will destroy the field, destroy the field, leaving nothing but scathing ashes. The wind starts to blow. Dark blue, gray, and black streaks tear the sky. Great clouds hover and the flowers are still chanting. The crashing noise of thunder and lightning splashes across the field. Melting marigolds turn into liquid fire and soon the whole field is ablaze. Behind swirling curtains of burning dust emerges a hair-raising, inhuman face. Immediately, Julia's heart fills with dread. Strange winged warriors fight the hot molten marigolds and it dawns on Julia that they are allies. The chanting subsides until suddenly replaced by chilling silence. Julia stands before the ever-growing, distorting face. She stands there, unable to fight. In front of her, the giant face collapses as the wave of gold lava merges into a yellow sea of dissolved miracles. Julia is shaking. The warriors seem bigger now. Slowly, she starts walking towards them. Who are they? Just as she reaches out a hand, they vanish into a whirlwind of folding dust, dragging her with them. She collapses on the hardwood floor of her studio. Once again, the day has gone. Julia puts down her paintbrush, too exhausted to be frightened. Bewildered, she gazes at her face. Images of the past appears. She remembers her mother. Silence sleeping from her every pore like thick glue smothering the voice of any living being foolish enough to get too close. She remembers looking into her dark, faraway eyes. Sometimes they would flare with disgust or anger as her words, like shards of glass, shred her soul to pieces. She remembers dying many times. Julia's heart aches as she reminisces about her childhood. Coming home after school, she would steal marigolds in the neighborhood gardens because it was her mother's favorite. She would make up stories to get her attention as if her mother kept stirring in a pot of soup without paying attention, lost in her own thoughts. Then she would abruptly tell her to go get the plates and set the table for dinner. Why did she keep returning to have the door slam in her face? She never gave up. She was insufferable with her constant need for attention. She would have given anything to make her mother smile just once and look kindly at her. At school, she made up stories about being her mother's beloved child and about all the exciting adventures they would share. She layered it on so thick, anyone with good sense would probably see right through the lines. Even now, Julia feels a sting of shame. The shame of being unwanted, invisible, unworthy. To this day, she can never admit when someone is wrong, but it's just too painful. She tolerates the pain and the abuse, covers up, makes excuses, and sinks every time a little lower, never revealing how much she hurts. When anger arises from the perpetual frustration, she goes on a self-destructive rampage. Kill the pain, kill the thoughts, kill the feelings. Yet somehow, she managed to never kill the hope or completely silence the dreams. Julia slumps on the nearest couch and cries. So many years of past wallowing. No wonder her love life is such a mess. How many meaningless liaisons did she have with men who were not in the slightest interested in to get into know her? Oh, they were at the beginning, until she smothered them. They would resent her and start being abusive when she doubled her efforts to meet their expectations. 
Danny is right. She is trading pieces of herself for a warm place to sleep. She has no one to blame but herself. Nobody can fill the abyssal emptiness. At the same time, she ironically never lets anyone try. Her relationships inevitably die for lack of oxygen. A knock on the door makes her jump. Her first reaction is to ignore the intruder until she remembers that Stone is delivering the canvas. She quickly wipes her cheeks and starts for the door. At this point, she couldn't care less about what the store owner might think of her disarray. She is on the verge of her stomach.